craft versus corporate whiskey. Yes. Now, we are no strangers to the giant whiskey brands. As a matter of fact, whenever we're doing things like lists yes. or like shared experiences and tastings with our fellow Magnificent Bastards. Or when people fly us to other countries. We're, we're doing this with the larger <laughs> brands with budgets yeah. and teams and all that stuff. Right. But in the world of whiskey, the craft scene, that's something special. Yeah, well, not only is it growing in leaps and bounds, or at least it was until COVID hit, <laughs> but it's also where some of our favorite innovations are happening. The problem with craft, we're gonna get into the pros and the cons. So we're gonna pop into one of our favorite craft distilleries. That's where right. are we right now? Andalusia Whiskey Company in Blanco, Texas. Let's go say things to people and drink whiskeys. Ty, Welcome, you guys. how are you, sir? Welcome. Wonderful to see you. See you Wonderful guys. to see you. Okay, so Ty, basically we're exploring the difference between modern day giant big whiskey makers and the smaller craft whiskey makers. Mm -hmm. cool. I'm assuming you know a thing or two about the small scene, yeah? Yes, not so much about the bigger scene, but yeah, we started a grain to glass distillery from the ground floor up, which is pretty rare. You know, I think a lot of people feel like it's a necessity to necessarily um, source whiskey or anything. It, it definitely makes the process a lot easier, but, but um, we don't feel it's, it's, it's crucial to the process. And so we wanted to do everything ourselves from day one. If you look at the history of some of the biggest brands in the world, you know, your Jameson uh, in Ireland or your, your McAllen or Glenmorangie, they looked a lot like this when they start. We know them now as giant brands with massive marketing budgets, right? right? But if you go look at the history of it, it's actually quite small. It helps when you know you're starting your distillery in times when whiskey isn't that popular, right? Oh yeah, that's always so, a wait. So, so, so good. So if you're, well, I mean, if you're starting in the '80s and '90s, you yes. know, you don't feel that pressure to just blow up immediately. Nor can you. The yeah. market doesn't dictate it. For the last four years, we've done head down, zero effort in marketing, um, advertising. How big's your marketing team? Yeah. Um, we spent about $100 on Facebook ads last year. And that was <laughs> <laughs> who spent it? Like, who clicked uh, the buy button? Right, yeah, yeah, was that, was, that was me, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so he's also the marketing team. department. Now, having said that, you'll never grow a brand to success with that model. But we needed to do that so we could invest every penny we had in malt and in grain because we didn't have the money at the time to have salespeople out in the market. We're just now to the point, actually today, where we're just getting to the point where we can sell whiskey at the same pace with it we're making it. Traditionally, single malt distillers are using, you know, relatively um, simple base malt, and that's it. Um, we're taking much more of a brewer's approach where we use kilned malts, caramel malts, roasted malts, and that's what you're seeing in the bottom layer there. The bottom layer contains roasted malts. They'll roast um, barley just like you'd roast coffee. Yeah. It's going to be black, um, and you're going to get all those nice roasted chocolate um, flavors from that. Um, and so we feel like we're doing much more of what a beer brewer would make whiskey. So Rex and I are talking, one of the big traps, or not traps, but just one of the big things that the big brands have to deal with is this is what we make and this is what people expect. Right. Right. Now, you're at the beginning of creating, you have lines, like people know Striker, people know uh, Revenant and so on, right? Do you feel like what you created for those products that people are now getting to taste has trapped you into a corner? Not at all. Um, I feel like we have a lot more leeway and uh, flexibility of kind of a range of flavors. Um, some of the larger brands are really kind of pigeonholed into a specific flavor profile. And if, if, if something deviates at all, it's a major problem for the distillery. You know, they'll blend hundreds of barrels together for consistency. Um, the big brewers do that as well. They use a hundred different types of hops because they want to have one single flavor in that final beer. Um, but what we want to do is have a little bit of fun and variation with it. Mm. Um, so um, each batch of Striker isn't quite single barrel, but it's only about three barrels. Right. And so you get a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say a lot of variation, but we get enough variation for it to be fun, right. but not enough for you to think that it's a totally different product. Okay, so we've been here minutes and already, like you're opening up the doors, we're seeing the grains, you got the hoses, you're turning things. This is a very, hands-on process right. yeah. and a lot of the other larger distilleries like the automation and the equipment it's, it's literally monitors right. and pushing buttons and do you feel like that hands-on component is that more fun does it show up in the whiskey how does that play out it's absolutely more fun um you know, there's, <laughs> yeah. no, there's no doubt about it um, i've worked at breweries of different sizes and and some of them involve you know very manual stirring 
others involve pushing buttons on screens. And, and trust me, this is just so much more fun. It's also a lot more hands-on. Like one thing I find is that when I'm a system that's a little more automated, I'm constantly checking it. Oh, because you can't to help it. To make sure it's doing the right thing. And trust me, it doesn't do the right thing all the time. <laughs> and so if you're constantly checking it anyway, shouldn't you just be making it yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so one of the bigger things that I would assume whenever it comes to the decision-making process of what you guys are working on, what you're putting through the still here, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a boardroom involved. Yeah, no. What does all. that process look like? How do you guys decide yeah. what the next project, the next experiment, what you're going to work on, how do you decide what that's going to be? There's no... Um sort of market decisions based upon this at all. I mean, I, you know, I, I just really hope what I like, people are gonna like. <laughs> That's it. I mean, um, the more creative and, and the funner it can be. Like, when we first got into whiskey, we thought, well, just doing high proof of 100 proof and doing a little girl finishing, that's really creative. And, <laughs> uh, now we've started to realize that we're going to have to get a lot more creative than that. Uh, well, and no surprise. I mean, people are going to be wanting more interesting things. And there's always that two to three year lag between when you have that idea for a product and then it finally comes to fruition. Where are the specific points that you're most interested in when it comes to, you know, getting creative in whiskey making? Are you talking about finishing, the grain being used? The, uh, yeah, what's, what's, it's two different philosophies. So you've got one philosophy of uh, finishing, and so that's something that you can come up with a cool idea and have a product in two months. Um, but you know, anything that involves the mash bill is going to be for us two to three years or more. Um, and so there's going to be a huge lag with that. But we don't think about that. You know, I mean, I, we'll make a product and one day it'll be ready. You know, I mean, that, that's all I really think about. You know, I'm already starting, I'm finally reading that, reaching that sweet spot where the fun projects I did two or three years ago are coming to fruition now. Mm. So I'm continually doing fun projects and just putting them away, but then the fun projects I made two or three years ago are, are ready now. Yeah. And so it finally seems worth it. When you're continually doing fun projects and just putting them away, it's pretty frustrating. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you're getting to drink too. Yeah. You don't yeah. ever get to try anything or even know what you're doing is even a good idea. That's right. very frightening. Um, so we don't get crazy, crazy, but you know, we'll finish with different different barrels. We have a maple syrup finished, um, or maple syrup aged um, whiskeys, um, wine finished um, mineral products, um, brandies, rums, um, getting into, you know, branching out a little bit from whiskey, but not too far. Yeah. <laughs> We've got uh, 250 gallons still, and only one still. Mm. Our, our, our ultimate dream is to have a stripping still and a finishing still. There'll be different sizes and composed of different materials, but this is what we got to start with. Um, 250 gallons, so it's nothing to sneeze at. It's a pretty different size, decent size. If we run the still seven days a week, we can produce two whiskey barrels every mm. week. Two full size, 53 gallon whiskey barrels every week. Is there a point to where all of a sudden this becomes a viable business model? You're making enough revenue, you're not just investing towards the future. How much whiskey do you need to be making and moving and selling bottle wise to make this a business to where, okay, I'm not just crossing my fingers and investing for the future, I'm actually making some money, I can invest in people, I can invest in the equipment more so. You know, we're already doing, you know, we're kind of breaking even right now, um, selling a fourth of what we sell. So you can oh imagine, wow, okay. So you can imagine. So yeah. with the demand on product of, that's sitting in barrels right now, only selling a fourth, right. you're paying everybody with a little bit of room to grow. Yep, and we're not in a huge, huge hurry to speed this process along because then you get locked in. The minute you sell exactly as much as you make, your whiskey never gets older, mm. never, right? Right. And so, so I hope we can maybe move to about 50% pretty soon um, yeah. so we could be a little more financially comfortable but still allow the whiskey to age. See that's something I hadn't thought about. It's true is if if everything you make is going out the door there's no then creativity ends pretty quickly. It never gets any older. So once we get locked in at three years everything will be three years forever. Right. And that's that's okay for a Texas whiskey three years is a decent age statement but that's not a that's not a real fantastic age statement in the right. world of whiskey. Right. Right. Three years. Um, and so you know, obviously things are different in Texas and blah 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 but you know, you're, you're, you're trying to market this whiskey across the, the nation and the world. Right. And, and so, you know, ultimately I like to be where our new stuff three to four years and our age stuff seven years. And then at that point, we're just going to squat and, and go. Now, you know, we are going to expand. You know, we have we plans to expand before that happens. Mm. Um, so I'd like to be finished um, doing filling about four or five, or excuse me, five to seven barrels a week instead of two barrels a week. Oh, that's quite an expansion. It is. Yeah. Yep. yeah. 
So at Andalusia, we hand bottle everything. When I mean hand bottle, I'm not joking. My wife, Erica, <laughs> had a stroke about 10 years ago. She can only use one of her hands. And so she does all this one-handed. I'm, I'm super, super, super impressed. Wow. Um, the whiskey will be in the tank. Um, the uh, filter is uh, only to catch large pieces of char. Yeah. Our whiskey is non-chill filtered. Um, so just the really giant chunks of char will be caught by the filter. The bottles are filled one at a time by it with one hand. She'll then slide it under and then um, ram the cork home and then uh, slap a label on all by hand, all one-handed. I, I try to put a label on with both my hands and I'm approaching the bottle and everything looks freaking fantastic. And the minute it hits the glass, it's freaking crooked as hell. I don't know how she does it, but she's filled 15,000 bottles with one hand. I'm, I'm very impressed. One of the main things about craft in any type of scene, right, be it um, beer, smaller wineries, distilleries, um, it's the, the local aspect. How does that play into your whiskey making decisions as far as the people, the local community? Yeah, sure. We're in um, outside of a little town called Blanco. Um, only about a town of 15, 1800 people. It's only two towns that size in the whole county. So the entire county is about 8,000 people, um, wow. less than my neighborhood in Austin that I lived in. So it's, it's definitely a big change for us, but we're only 45 minutes from Austin or San Antonio. So I feel like we, we can still draw upon you know, the, the talent base from larger metropolitan areas and still get great local people as well. One of the most common questions people have is how do I um, get into whiskey? Like they're enamored with this idea yeah. of being in the craft whiskey scene and making stuff and tasting things and checking in on barrels and, and all of that. Yep. And even if you don't necessarily have the ability to get a job job, I think the influence that just a regular customer has whenever they find a local distillery that they're a regular face at, they're having conversations with the distillers, with the people working in the barrel house, that level of influence, I mean, holy hell, that's damn near like an employee because you constantly see that person, you begin to trust their palate. You'd be amazed what um, you know, just a little bit of interest in a product can do for you as a customer. It's you like know? telling a parent their kid is cute. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're just fawning over it. Yeah. You know? And so anytime anybody shows any interest in us or our products, you know, we, we definitely take that, their input um, and, and use it um, in our production process. You know, and we, we only want to know what people make. We want to know what people like and what they want us to make. Rex, we forgot the ad. Rex. This episode brought to you by the Wizard of Ads Partners. These are marketing professionals that specialize in turning small biz Oh, there you are. They specialize in turning small businesses into big businesses. If you'd like to learn more about the Wizard of Ads, you can go to www.wizardofads.com to find a right professional strategist big boy for you. <laughs> Is whenever the um, the coronavirus initially hit, the number of craft distilleries that said stop everything, hand sanitizer, yep. and the, even spirit that we were distilled about to be putting in a barrel, nope, turn it into hand sanitizer. They're they're basically outpouring their their blood, sweat, and tears, the products to turn it into hand sanitizer. So people in that moment of time, that window of time, this was like a life saving thing. We're going to step up. We're going to do what we can for our community. And at the, within just months of that happening, the decision makers, the lawmakers, is like, hey, thanks for the solid, thanks for the hand sanitizer. By the way, shut your sh down. Crickets. No, yeah. you can't ship. No, you can't have a tasting room. Under the same rules as restaurants, none of that. Mm -hmm. Bye. I think that's a real difficult issue for scientists, yeah. not for, I'm saying for, for us. Ship. But but if you're not going to let us open, which I don't think we should, probably anyways, then let us do something else. Yeah, yeah. let us survive. That's all it's, loosen it's regulation let us make, survive. Loosen regulation that made sense during normal times, right. but doesn't now. Um, and I think, um, you know, we were declared, uh, the fact that we switched, we were not declared essential at first. Right. But the fact that we started making hand sanitizer made us essential, mm. like le legally, it made us an essential business. So the state of Texas recognizes us as an essential business, but I don't think they really appreciate us yet. Mm. As I mean, like a lot of states 
um, when this happened, their hospitals, their nursing homes, their EMTs were f***ed. They had no hand sanitizer. There were no local distilleries to give them anything. Right. And I think the governor really doesn't, the governor of Texas doesn't appreciate what he has. Mm -hmm. He has this entire industry that when things get bad, can make this sanitizer for him if he needs it. And a lot of other states don't have that. And, and we really, you know, by him not even responding to our requests yeah, we, is where we really feel unappreciated. It, it was, Say no and explain why. Right. Say no and explain why. But don't just ignore us. Uh, and we don't have to get deep into what you guys are doing here, but in general, the pulse of other craft uh, distilleries in Texas, like what's what's the scene like? Is Are the people struggling? Is it getting critical? Is it Do they find little <clears throat> footholds here and there? What's the overall vibe? Currently, you know, according to the Whiskey Association, it's about probably about a third of us that are in real financial trouble, as mm -hmm. in like failing by the end of the year financial trouble. Yeah. And probably the rest of the half of us by the end of next year. Um, we're in a unique situation where I live here on the farm. We can live poor. You can keep the overhead low. We don't have children, blah, 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 blah. I have not to support not, this one. Not everybody yeah, has that luxury, right? Um, going forward. Um, I think we're going to see a shocking number of distilleries and the sophistication of those efforts are really going to rise dramatically. Mm. I think we're going to see Still Austin's open up f several a year um, and then a lot of other maybe more sophisticated, more well-funded efforts. And I mentioned them because they're mm -hmm. very well-funded and a really awesome facility and stuff right. like that. Yeah. And we're going to see lots of those crop up and we're going to have to try to compete with those all of a sudden. <laughs> it's going to be tough. Yeah. The current climate, this is a hell of a situation. Yep. But the future, on the whole, you're optimistic about it. You Absolutely. see amazing yeah. good things happening. It's, it's, it's just going to require more effort and sophistication and, and investment um, and education and research, all those things. You're not going to be able to just show up and, and half-ass it anymore, which I don't know of anybody that's done that, but like... I tried um, to. He, it, won't, he won't let me. It'll require <laughs> a lot more effort in the future going forward, um, you know, with, with distilleries that are going to be opening, which is a good thing. That means mm. the spirits are going to be better. Yeah. Um, products are going to be better. Um, you can't. You're just not going to do the, the mom and pop operation as easily anymore. Well, I very much hope you're right. Thank you so much for the tour. Cool. Yeah. Cheers, time. guys. Cheers Wait, to you, sir. Why is my glass empty? What happened there? Don't worry about it. <laughs> I left you a little. <laughs> yeah.